This is the Engineering Enablement Podcast. I'm your host, Avi Noda. This week's guests are Rebecca Parsons, ThoughtWorks CTO, along with Camilla Crispim and Eric Dorenberg. This episode focuses on the ThoughtWorks Tech Radar, a publication that I've followed and been a fan of for many years. We start off by getting an overview of what Tech Radar is and a history of how it began and what it looked like in its earliest form. We then fast forward to today, getting an in-depth look at how each report is built and produced through an extensive process involving numerous teams and stakeholders. Finally, we wrap up by talking about how the design and process for Tech Radar continues to evolve and future changes that the team is considering. If you're a fan of ThoughtWorks Tech Radar, this episode gives you a great behind the scenes look at its history and how it's produced. Big thanks to Rebecca, Camilla, and Eric for coming on the show. I hope you enjoyed listening. Rebecca, Camilla, Eric, so great to have you on the show today. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having us, Abby. Happy to be here. I've personally followed the ThoughtWorks Tech Radar for many years and I'm a big fan. Uh, I imagine most listeners of this show have at least heard of the Tech Radar. But I'd love to begin with you guys just giving a, a brief overview of what the Tech Radar is, and then we'll get into the history of the Tech Radar and more of what listeners can take away from it. The Tech Radar is our take on the breadth of technologies that we have exposure to. It has four quadrants, languages and frameworks, tools, techniques, and platforms. And it has four rings. The outer ring is the hold ring. And that's probably the most ambiguous because that might mean don't go there yet. It's not ready. Or it might also mean, please stop doing this. This is not a good idea anymore. And I try to keep very close control over the hold ring, frankly. But then we also have an assess ring, which is, hey, this looks pretty interesting. We're not saying you should use it yet, but this might be something you want to take a look at. The trial ring is something that where we have actual production experience with it. And this is something that we believe our enterprise clients can use in real projects. And then the adopt ring is something that we think is the sensible default for its category. And that last clause for its category is important. Because, for example, we put Neo4j as a graph database. Well, that's not saying abandon your relational databases, everything should be in a graph database. It's if you're looking for a graph database, you know, that this is one that, that you can use. And so that adopt is the sensible default for it for its category. Well, the tech radar is a compilation of our global experiences with a broad range of technologies. And there are several, to me, key aspects to that. The first is global, because the experience that people have with technology in Singapore might be different than what people have in Brazil or in India or in Germany. And so we source from across all of our projects, across all of our currently 18 countries, to find out what our people are actually using and their specific experiences with it. We want this to be very grounded in actual experience as opposed to this is what the vendor has to say about things. So we might say, this is great to do this thing, but it might say on the tin that you can do this with it, but we wouldn't recommend it because there are there are these sorts of problems. So it's grounded in actual experience and it's globally sourced and it's across a broad range of technologies. We make no claims that it is comprehensive. We very often get, why isn't X on the list? Well, because none of our teams have used it. Also, we make no claims to, and we make no attempts to talk to the people responsible for a tip for a particular language. I got uh, an email not all that long ago. Why didn't you talk to us before you put us on your radar? We don't talk to anybody. This is based on our experience and that's all it's based on. You can't pay to get on the radar, you know, and the way to get on the radar is for one of our teams to have some actual 
experience with it, or at least be taking a look at it for something. I would add one more thing to your list, and that is that the radar is recent. It's a snapshot of what we've seen the last six months, because that's also often the question or the answer to the question, why is something not on the radar? It is simply that we have mentioned it six months before, 12 months before, a year ago. We do not keep everything that we feel is relevant on the radar. Every six months, we're reporting on what we have, for ourselves, discovered in the previous six months, and that is what we report on. This is actually something that changed over time. Um, the Something which we call uh, blip, um, use it to be on the radar for two or three editions before it actually like fades. Uh, now something has to fight to be there. So it, we should have something to say about it in order to keep from one volume to the next volume. Otherwise, it's going to disappear from the current volume. Thanks for the overview of what the tech radar is. If you're listening to this, there's a bit of terminology that's thrown out. Uh, one you'll hear is blip. And for listeners, just so you know what that means, a blip just refers to an actual item, a, a particular technology or platform practice that is in the tech radar. One thing I've been curious about as I've dug into the tech radar and followed it for a number of years is how did the tech radar actually begin? I mean, I'm curious to know what was the, the V1 of the tech radar? Was it just a blog post or was it a, a report like it is today? And, and what sparked the tech radar? Why was it originally created? Um, since you mentioned version one, I can tell you what version 0 0.9 was as a technologist. And that was the so-called hot technology list, which we compiled as a list, and I remember being responsible for that in, the, in a precursor to the meeting where we designed the radar as just a list of technologies that we needed to be aware of. And then the person who was the assistant to the group at the time improved on that notion and said, why do we have a list and came up with this radar metaphor? And then that was very, very quick. And we've settled on that metaphor. We've settled on the structure in the first edition. The only change I would say that was made was we viewed it as we did that technology list as an internal resource. But very quickly, other people told us, our clients and other people that we talked to about this, told us that they see value in it. So we made it public. And I don't know, Rebecca, was it the very first one that was internal or did we even publish the first one in retrospect? I think there was limited publication of the first one because there were several people who knew members of the group who put the first one together and said, I'd like to see that. And so there was a limited publication, but it very quickly became something that we just put out there and said, hey, if you're interested, here it is. And then, of course, it matured and we got a bit more structured around it. One thing that I, I wanted to share about this first versions of the radar, I did a retrospective and in the 10 years of the tech radar and I, I presented in a webinar and I could see like things that are industry standards or the way to go as, for example, evolutionary architecture. It was in our first ever tech radar. Uh, so it was kind of interesting to see how different things or components kind of were built on top of each other and then became like a concept uh, over time and, and things of that nature. So it was quite nice exercise to do. It's really interesting that the tech radar and the hot technology list began internally and then there was organic pull from your clients to make it external. Before we go into the, the philosophy of the tech radar and, and how it's designed to be used, I mean, in your view, what was the market pull coming from? Like, what was the problem that your clients had that they were hoping that you sharing this list would help them solve? Well, I think part of it is if you think about the day-to-day -day life of a developer within an enterprise, they're in a domain, they're working on a technology stack, they're probably working on some aspect of the technology estate of that enterprise. And that's the view that they have of the technology industry. And to get a different domain or a different tech stack, they have to move companies. By definition, thought workers work across companies, across domains, very often across tech stacks. And so we get a breadth of experience as individuals 
that most developers in the software industry simply don't get. And so one of the common questions that we get asked when we are consulting with our clients is, tell me what's happening elsewhere. Well, this is a vehicle to tell people this is what's happening elsewhere. Uh, because again, this is this is grounded in the things that we think are, you know, in the early days, the things that we were doing that we thought were relevant, that we thought more should be happening with. And that was true across the different clients that we have in the different countries, in the different technology stacks. So, you know, this is not a Java only radar or a Microsoft radar or a whatever radar. There are technologies from many different technology providers, different parts of the ecosystem, but we get that breadth that most enterprise developers don't see unless they move companies. Yeah, and in many ways, Rebecca, what you described as the earlier use cases was a bit of de-risking. People knowing about new technologies, but not quite knowing, should I jump on them because I don't have experience? I don't have necessarily the time to experiment with that. And then drawing on the experience of ThoughtWorks, of all the experience we gathered in different engagements. I think increasingly, and that's maybe also a sign of how I'm working, increasingly personally, but also when I talk to people, they're also seeing it not only as a risk mitigation mechanism, but as a discovery mechanism. Not so much to say, I know about this technology, but I haven't had a chance to try it, but just to say, because there is so much technology, to say, I didn't even know this existed. And then they probably don't necessarily draw on the conclusions ThoughtWorks has, has taken, um, on the conclusions that ThoughtWorks has taken, but they might just think, now that I know this tool exists, I'm going to do my own evaluation. I mean, there's, there's so many tools in the space of data analytics that fall into this category because they, they just keep appearing. It's such an interesting point you shared, Rebecca, that you know, ThoughtWorks is unique and that you have a view into so many different teams and companies, or as, like you said, most practitioners only have familiarity with the environment in which they currently work, which doesn't necessarily change all that often. So I can see how the tech radar is this remarkable tool for insight for leaders and practitioners across the industry. I'm curious, have you also seen it be a tool for driving change and influence within an organization? We'll talk about how Tech Radar is different than things like the Gartner and Forrester uh, quadrants, but you know those tools are used by champions internally to drive decisions. I'm curious if you've seen similar things happen with the Tech Radar where folks within organizations are using it to influence decision-making or influence architecture decisions or technology adoption decisions? We have certainly heard of many cases where our thought workers have gone in to a client situation and said, this is what the radar has to say about this and used it to try to influence decisions. The hold ring is particularly popular for that when we are trying to help organizations understand the consequences of some of the drag that they have from legacy architectural choices. And we'll, we'll try to talk about and use the language from the radar as a way of being more specific. You know, it's one thing to say, you know, X is bad. It's much more powerful to say X is hurting you in this specific way, and we've seen that specific pain play out in these other places. And so we can use it as a, you know, as, as a proof point, if you will, for some of the recommendations that, that we have. I want to remind listeners that the hold ring is things that you have experience with, but caution against. And I think you mentioned this is a category that you have a lot of passion for. I think it's so important in tech because, as we know, there, there's so many new hot things that folks jump on the bandwagon with. And then years later, we often start hearing the the horror stories or the cautionary tales around certain technologies or practices. The other day when we were chatting, we had a discussion around the philosophy of the tech radar. And one thing that you all brought up was that it's really important that this be advice for your audience rather than just the compilation of what's interesting. Can you explain more about what you mean by this and how you try to make the tech radar actionable? One of the key things really is on the tech radar that we're trying 
as you said, Abby, that we are trying to provide more than just it exists. And oftentimes, I mean, it's partly built into the mechanism of how the radar is created, because there are proposals from our teams, from individuals who are saying, I think this should be included in the ThoughtWorks technology radar. And the group that gets together that all the three of us are part of, we could simply take them, put them on the radar, copy paste the marketing text or the text from the open source pages onto the radar and be done with it. But as especially in the inner rings of the radar that Rebecca described, in the inner rings, we do want to have the notion of saying we need to give some advice here. We don't only want to say that tool exists. We do a couple of sanity checks, usually saying, like, I mean, has to, if it's open source software, it's easy to see. Is this tool still being developed? And part of the implied advice, if it appears in the inner rings, is, yes, this tool is actually usable. And some of the more explicit advice could be because teams are proposing these tools or techniques or practices to us that we're saying, we're actually not listing all the features. We're saying this tool is particularly good for X. Or we're saying our experience was the combination of those tools really makes a lot of sense. So when we are discussing, and we didn't mention this so far, we get way more proposals for new entries per radar volume than we can actually fit on the radar. It's often three or four times as many as would actually fit on it. And then that's often a criterion that we apply to say, we have not much more to say about this entry than it exists. If it's a really new thing and part of the group or the majority of the group even says, I've never heard of it, that might be enough because it's clearly something that is interesting and not enough people by some definition know about it. But in many other cases, we're like, yeah, of course, everybody knows this tool. If you are in front-end development, everybody would know this tool. So us listing it on the radar doesn't contain any advice. So then we would maybe contrast it with, if it's a new one, contrast it with tools that maybe a lot of people are using, which we know from previous radars, which we know from our working experience, and say, this is something you should try if that's your context. Or this is different from the one that we've listed three volumes ago because I mean, in the simplest case, it does the same thing, but it's faster. That's rarely the case that it's as simple, but just to give you an example, this is really how we try to get advice into the radar beyond just listing technologies. And that's why it's such a step forward from that technology list that I mentioned earlier. Another important piece of advice is when a tool can do many different things or a framework can do many different things. And we have specific advice, whether it be positive or negative about one particular use case for it, where actually it does really well here, but here is a limitation. If you try to get too complex or too many branches or something where we've hit a limit where it went from being incredibly easy to use and effective to just way too convoluted, helping people understand a vendor might tell you, yes, it works in all of these cases for some definition of works. And so we can characterize, okay, stay in this box and you've got a great tool that's easy to use and does the job really well. Go outside the box, there would be dragons there. That's a really good leeway into the next question I had, which is I brought up Gartner and Forrester a few minutes ago. And I'm sure this question comes up all the time in, in conversations, but how is TechRadar different than the types of insights, similar recommendations and insights that come from analyst firms like Gartner and Forrester? Well, I would say the first is, to my understanding, we don't have working development teams in Forrester and Gartner who are actually using these. And so, although they will talk to customers it's often indirect from the perspective of the practitioner who is actually hands-on keyboard doing something with this technology. And so that's one d distinction. We don't talk to the people responsible for the tool or, or the technique. Even when it's a thought worker, we'll put an open source project for a thought worker on the radar and we won't even go talk to them about it because we want it to be grounded in the experience of people who aren't the creators of it. And so that's another distinction there. And I do think that Forrester and Gartner are more concerned with, at least at a particular scale, being comprehensive. 
we make no claims about that. You know, we've had some, you know, various persistence mechanisms. I'm sure there are some that we've missed and that's okay because we didn't have what we felt was anything useful to say about it. Whereas they are more concerned about being a bit more comprehensive, even if they may only be looking at the major players. And we might put a major player and some very niche player that we, for whatever reason, have experience with on the same radar. And that's highly unlikely to happen in, in one of the more analyst reports. Although they do often have you know special mentions for players that have that they've spotted that aren't big enough to make the magic quadrant or, you know, what wave or whatever the particular main report is. But I'd say that's uh, some of the distinctions that come to my mind. Another difference between Tech Radar and some of the, the analyst reports is that, as you've mentioned, you know, Tech Radar ThoughtWorks doesn't really commingle with vendors who, in regards to those other analyst firms, are often. Uh, part of the process of those reports getting developed and have influence over the people developing them. Could you share more about how TechRadar remains neutral and independent and why you think that's so important and valuable for your audience? As I said, we don't talk to the vendors. I have been approached over the years. What does it take to get on the radar? And my reply is always the same. If it's used on one of our projects and somebody proposes it, it can get on the radar. That's the only way. I did have somebody, in fact, be so bold as to say, how much money do I have to pay you to get on the technology radar? And I said, there is no amount of money that you could pay to get on the technology radar. I think the importance of it is, again, we are grounding this in our experience. And the importance of that can't be overstated. We want to be able to tell people this is what is going to happen if you use this thing in these situations. And by grounding it only in our experiences, there's a purity to that. There isn't the marketing speak. There isn't the, okay, I've gone through all of the checkboxes. Now, you know, put, put me on the radar. I was actually talking to an alumni of ThoughtWorks who works for a product company now. And the president of the company said, you used to work for ThoughtWorks, get us on the radar. And the response was <laughs> the same. You get on a radar by being used on one of the projects. So figure out <laughs> how, how to start working with one of their clients or maybe bring them in on one of our clients so they have experience working with, with the product. That's such a central part to what the radar represents for our readers and why it's so valuable that they know this isn't some vendor in the background whispering in our ears saying, oh, geez, and, and just say how blindingly fast or blazingly fast. That's one of the <laughs> phrases that we hear a lot. That grounding in the actual experience, it's essential to something getting on the radar. And you simply can't do that by evolving the vendors because they are going to want to give you these four page explanations for why you might have run into that particular problem. And it's like, I don't want that. We need to tell people that this is going to be the problem. So something else is, at least in my understanding, different in the technology radar is that we don't have to compare a class of tools. So if something changes over time, we're not publishing at one point in time a comparison of, to stay with the example we used before, all the JavaScript frameworks. We are at liberty to, a year later, say, here's a new framework and describe why this is an improvement over the existing ones, but just list one of them, which means we can get that kind of comprehensiveness that some of the reports that need to choose a point in time to compare a whole class of related technologies that they can't do. And the other one that the other freedom we also get is we have so many people, consultants working on engagements with our clients that will often find really obscure things that you would normally never get. We talked at length about how maybe more commercial companies want to get on the radar, but there's these useful little nuggets, these really small tools that you have to almost discover by accident. And that is something we can do on the radar because just somebody of the over like thousands of consultants in ThoughtWorks has discovered and has proposed, I guess we'll talk later about how we make the radar, but just somebody has to find this and we can feature it. 
And that is, I guess, something that wouldn't generally work that way with the larger reports. So we, we don't have the comprehensiveness of comparing everything at the same time, but we get comprehensiveness in other ways or other kinds of comprehensiveness, if you know what I mean. I'd love to shift into explaining to the listeners how this report is actually created and published uh, twice per year. So if I'm understanding, first, there's unstructured nomination process where ideas are just being shared by different teams, different folks across ThoughtWorks. And then it moves into slightly more formal rounds of nomination where people are in live meetings pitching or justifying the reasoning for nominating something. And then there's a process of finalizing that list. And can you share more then on how that second step works, that the finalization of the list? And, and does I imagine this is still a step prior to where you determine the details of where the thing being nominated should live within the radar? Actually, we do the collection at various... Um... We do have different formats of doing the collection of the blips because, you know, people engage in different ways. So they might join calls or they might like fill up forms or they do ping us privately and say, hey, you should consider this or that. And then we do the filtering. And once we get together, then that's when you are going to pitch whatever thing you want on the, on the radar. And we do vote for it to be on the radar in that specific place. So uh, there is no kind of like rounds of it. Let's say it should be or not uh, or not on the radar. But in, and then we come back and say in this ring or that ring, which we do vote specifically for a certain quadrant and ring. And we can still repropose that to be in a different ring. And it might get to the radar if we do that. But usually it is blip by blip. And then we... It always can change, but usually we do get to the final quadrant and ring once we are talking about it. Yeah, and it's important to talk about the people that are involved in the different phases. There is a group, internally we call a Doppler for the radar, and that is the group that actually makes the decisions about what ends up at the radar where, that actually writes up the blips and all of that. But the collection process, which happens before that, we don't have members of that group for all of the countries where we have offices. And so we try to make sure that there is some member of that group that is involved enough in the blip collection process that they can do that pitch that Camilla was mentioning. And so, but we go out across all of ThoughtWorks and talk to as many people as we can get as many blip proposals with as much information as we can. As Eric pointed out earlier, I think the last radar, we had something like 367 proposals for the radar, roughly that number. And that was after the filtering that the individuals went through. So those were the ones that actually made it to the master list of this is what we are going to go through. And then that list goes to the Doppler group to start to call through and decide, yes, this is important enough. No, this is not. We try for roughly 100 blips at the end. And so each radar comes in with about 100 blips. And then we have all the new entries. We filter those down. Then we look at things that might be moving, say, from assess to trial because we've got more experience with it. And during that process, uh, as Camilla said, things are, are located in particular places. Uh, we go through a round of what we call the final call of, okay, we have to get down to this number. We have 130. That's too many. We have 40 in this particular quadrant and ring, and that's too many. And so we, we filter things to try to make sure only the most important blips or the, the things that we have the most to say about are actually represented on the radar. And then we do a lifeboat session where if somebody lost an argument, oh, but I think I've got a new argument, I'm gonna try once again. And sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't. One of the things you've described is this process of live meetings where there's debate and discussion and argument about whether something should be on the tech radar and where it should live. In your FAQ on the website, I was reading it this morning, 
and you, you describe it in in a fun way. Uh, you, you say this discussion is always enjoyable. There are lots of opinions and experiences around the room, but there's also a friendliness and mutual respect that makes the arguments much less grating than these kinds of discussions sometimes become. As I read that, I just pictured what these meetings must be like, because at ThoughtWorks, of course, you have so many strong-minded and brilliant people with, with so much experience and diverse perspective coming together to have these types of discussions. It must be lively, to say the least. So sure, like bring us behind the scenes a little bit. Mean, how are these meetings like? So I think one thing that is very uh, unique, almost unique, I would say, to these meetings is you have 20 technologists in the room. And in the earliest versions, the meetings were lively to the extent that everybody was just talking over each other. And it wasn't really a good discourse anymore. It was really just almost waiting for the other person person to stop talking so you could just jump in and make your point. And the key thing that changed all of that was when Rebecca started to have speaker lists. So now it is it looks, I guess, if you were an observer, it might look really a bit weird, but people really raise their hand a little bit and Rebecca writes down the initials on a card and you know that we'll work through the speaker. So there is no rush or anything, which also means you don't have to wait for the other person to stop talking. You can actually listen to them, which makes your response later on much better because you have actually had the time to actively listen to the other person. And more often than not, it can also lead to the point where you're saying, my point has been made already. And it really gives the conversation a much, much better spread across the different angles with which, from which you can look at one of the arguments. I think this also speaks to the diversity of the room. We do have a lot of native English speakers, but we also have a lot of people who doesn't have English as their first tongue. I think it gives us, and speaking as the, the ones who are not English native speakers, the opportunity to make a point without like rushing it or being afraid to, you know, being cut off or something like that. So it's independent on how like how, how loud you are or not, or um, introvert, extrovert, or differences in that nature, you have a voice. And it's very, it is different to be in that room because of that, I guess. Rebecca, what's it like to moderate this process. I mean, I, I think about our company and having one meeting about one technology, I feel pretty exhausted <laughs> afterwards. So what's it like being in the room and uh, facilitating this process? Once the meeting is finally over, I enjoy not talking to anybody <laughs> because it is exhausting. As, as you say, we've got people who are very passionate, very articulate and intelligent, and and yet it is respectful. And so, you know, we don't get into, you know, these, you know, personal attacks or anything like that. I don't have to moderate those. What I have to moderate uh, is making sure that people have a chance to have their say. And there are some disadvantages because sometimes the list gets so long that, you know, Eric puts his hand up for a particular point and we go through seven or eight people on the list. And it might be not that necessarily that the point has been made, but it isn't particularly relevant anymore. And so that is one of the things that you lose. Now, I have modified the process slightly to allow for, you know, if there's a really important clarification, like Camilla made a point and Eric was next and said something specific about the point, I, I will often allow Camilla to, you know, either to clarify or something like that. But in general, by structuring it that way, we get the breadth of perspectives. And then at the end of the discussion, we come to a resolution. It's also, by the way, a good way of me being able to detect rabbit holes. Because when I start my second line of writing you know, two initials, and we're still talking about the same thing. It's like, okay, I'm, you know, I've got this person, this person, this person, this person, and then we're going to call a vote. Sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. Um, <laughs> but it is a good way of just detecting when you're starting to circle the drain a little bit. And it's like, okay, we've got to, we've got to start to put some pro specific proposals on the table. So everyone's 
opinions, rationale, arguments have been heard, votes have been cast. You mentioned earlier there's the Doppler team that's the the final decision maker. So what happens after this review process? Does the Doppler team or group make the final call and then move on to the publishing step? Describe to listeners what happens after these meetings. Well, the first step after the meeting is we have roughly 100 write-ups to do. They're all very small. One of the categories, by the way, for a blip, one dispensation is too complex to blip. If we can't explain the nuance in three to five sentences, we're not going to put it on the radar because with you know a hundred of them, we can't have a page on each. Nobody would, would read it. And so the target is to have something that where we can get our description and advice out succinctly. And those are written by the Doppler group, but we send it out to review to the various mailing lists and chat rooms within ThoughtWorks and incorporate comments from the broader ThoughtWorks. But the Doppler group has the final say on what's on the radar and what the radar says. So if somebody brings up a point and the Doppler group does not agree, it'll go out the way the Doppler group decided. There's no way I'm going to try for consensus around, you know, all the thousands of technical thought workers across the globe. And that just (laughs) doesn't happen. (laughs) Although we're usually not very far off. And then the whole publication process begins with the translations. We publish it in Chinese, in uh, Portuguese, in Spanish. We have from time to time done a Thai version, an Italian version. There has been some efforts to do a version in French. And so different translations also happen for this. What is sometimes fun to see, though, is when we when the people who are part of the Doppler group have decided on what's on the radar. And then there's an informal, not really a process, but people just start picking the entries that need to be written and do the write ups. And then, as Rebecca described, they get put. We use a Google Doc for this. They would put into a Google Doc and then to be reviewed by essentially anyone who wants in ThoughtWorks and provide comments on it. And what is sometimes fun to see is that the same rabbit holes that we ran into at the meetings of the Doppler group that preceded us putting it on the radar, they begin to repeat in, you know, in the margin where you can put the comments on a document. And then sometimes the people who write it see there's interesting feedback and maybe we just revise the text a little bit to almost preempt the readers to go down the same rabbit hole. So we're not necessarily changing the content, but it's often good. And in all fairness, though, I mean, sometimes it takes me, I mean, it's only a few sentences and most of the time it doesn't take that long, but I've spent three hours on writing some of those sentences and still not got it right. And then I'm really grateful that we have all the consultants. I mean, not everybody looks over everything, obviously, but I'm really grateful for the consultants to look over this and then say, are you sure about this? Or or maybe more bluntly saying, you got this wrong. And I'm like, thank you. So there's this process that gives us a bit of safety and I think is essentially, in the end, responsible for what I believe, at least, to be the high quality of the radar because it has so many reviewers and it is being reviewed by people who actually use the technology and and use them on a day-to-day level because that's clearly the 20 people who are in the Doppler group we clearly cannot use all the technology on a daily level. So things may slip or we may misunderstand something in the proposal process. And that then gets caught later in the process. And I don't know when it started, but it's definitely at least three, four, five years ago that we added this review step before we published radar. One of the things you shared with me earlier that I was surprised by and found really interesting is that everything you're doing with Tech Radar is actually tracked in a Git repository. Share with listeners how this works and what the value is in for your audience and perhaps going and checking out this Git repository. If there's more technology, to be honest, even it's not only Git. We're also using Trello and we use Google Docs and Google Sheets. So I wish there was one comprehensive suite. And that's, I think, the dream of all members of the Doppler group that we would get actually an end-to-end process that does it. But the Git part is clearly the one where we're writing the text. And that is ex- exactly what Git is really good for, to manage text, to, su- to see the differences. One step we didn't mention so far is, Camilla alluded to it in a way, noting that not all of us are English speakers, but even native English speakers are not necessarily great writers. And also, 
I would say even though you can detect certain variants when reading the radar, there is a common language style in it. So there's a copy editor. The copy editor, though, isn't a technology at heart. I mean, he's got, or there is a couple of them by now. They've gotten quite good. But sometimes when they try to make the non-native English that Camilla and I write more English, they change something, which what we meant may be two parallel statements, they create a causality. And with Git, it's super good because when we make the changes, we can write the text, somebody else can edit it. The copy editor makes their changes and then we can look over and see what did the copy editor actually change. We can see the diff and say, they're all good or they will know better what we know. I mean, that looks like better English than what I wrote. But in certain cases, you read it and think, actually, this is now creating a, or making a statement that wasn't intended or actually is not correct. And then you can revert the change. So we're really managing the text entries. And of course, it is really good if we revisit something after three years because we have something new to say. It's quite nice to have the old text. Eric mentioned about the uh, copy editor also happens in translation as well, because we need to have a very specific set of translators. You can't just send this out to you know, a translation ad, a agency or a automatic translation, even though it's getting better and all of that, because again, there are those nuances that just don't come through properly. And so there's actually quite a bit of work that goes on in making sure that the translated text makes sense. And that that does impact sometimes to what we call a blip. There was one blip that English speakers were so excited about many years ago, and it was the security sandwich that we put on hold, that you think about security at the beginning, and then you ignore it, and then you think about security at the end. And somebody from our Brazil office says, I have no idea how I'm going to translate that into Portuguese. That it, you know, it just sort of loses that connotation that made so much sense. And so we are certainly more cognizant of that now as well than we were, you know, in the early days of the translations. But it is very specific and highly technical language. And therefore, we have to be very careful, not only with copy editing, but also with translation. Awesome. Okay. One of the things that you all have shared with me in prior conversations is that the process for putting together the tech radar is constantly changing. So I'd love to share with listeners, what are some ways in which the process has recently changed or is, is in the process of changing currently that you think are interesting? With the last volume of the radar was, we got so many blip proposals for one specific area that we didn't treat the proposals individually anymore. Normally, we go through them as we described, right? I mean, we talk about them. Is it a valid proposal? Is it not? And then later, if we have too many in a specific category, we go through again and take out the ones that are the least strong, where we have the least advice. It feels, though, that in the tech industry, maybe it's just something that is in the moment and it will stop, but it feels that the hypes are getting bigger. And as ThoughtWorks is getting bigger, we're getting more proposals. The Web3 wasn't that strong because we had actually listed a lot of technologies earlier around the blockchain, the development environments, and so on. So the technology ran ahead of the actual hype that we saw in a lot of the media, but already we did see quite a bit. But this time around, the last time in spring, and now especially the one that we just wrote, the peak of tools around Gen AI was incredible. I think we had 60 or 70 proposals for technologies in that space. And it was it broke our process to a certain extent. So we actually ended up using yet another tool. We used Mural to actually put all the proposals and then started shuffling them around and seeing which one could you group? Which one are we saying too much about this area, even though there's maybe 10 things we could say something about it, but it's maybe a niche area. This was particular about how can you make LLMs run on different hardware. And there were interesting entries on their own right, but it really broke the process we had before. And maybe that is something because I think the experience was quite good. If we face this again, that we get so many proposals that are all interrelated where we could go, let's summarize five of them in one blip around, say, that's a technique for a specific thing, that we could repeat that as well in the future. But maybe we won't see another wave another hype wave as strong for another three, four years. We don't know this, but at least now we have another tool to deal with such things. Camilla, Rebecca, Eric, this has been a really fascinating conversation. I've really enjoyed learning more about the history and the process around Tech Radar. 
Thanks so much for your time today and sharing this with listeners. Thanks for having us, Avi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. As always, you can find detailed show notes and other content at our website, getdx.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Please also consider rating our show since this helps more listeners discover our podcast. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you.